Let's rise for the Holy Gospel appointed for this Sunday, which carries on with what we were hearing earlier from Matthew chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. As with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision. Tell no one what you've seen until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We're seated for the next hymn, and a hymn again that celebrates the transfiguration of our Lord. Good Lord, to be here. Thy glory fills the night. Thy face and garments like the sun shine with unborrowed light. Tis good, Lord, to be here. Thy beauty to behold. Where Moses and Elijah stand, thy messengers of old. Fulfiller of the past, and hope of things to be, we hail thy body glorified, and our redemption see. Before we taste of death, we see thy kingdom come. We long to hold the vision bright and make this hill our home. Tis good, Lord, to be here. Your free will not remain, but since thou bidst us leave the mount, come with us to the plain. Our text this morning from the Holy Gospel reading this section. As they, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. We pray, gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to us all. In the name of Jesus, our transfigured Lord and Savior. Amen. As we heard already a couple of times this morning, we witnessed in various ways of Peter, James, and John, the disciples, three disciples with Jesus. A little later on, and this is on the cross of Calvary, there was John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He loved 
all the disciples and all, all people of all the world, including us. But here is John. Anyway, he looked up. He thought he'd, he'd seen Jesus like this, but never like that on the cross. He saw Jesus as teacher, as prophet, as a priest, incredible, but not on the cross. He couldn't have imagined Jesus being on the cross. And so it is. It was overwhelming when John and, and the rest of the disciples and the people around him heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, or you will be today in paradise. Or the words, it is finished, over. And John, being amazed, he bowed his head, and Jesus did too, of course. And Jesus died. That was Good Friday. Today's the Feast of the Transfiguration. It's not the day of Jesus dead, but the day of Jesus glorified in his glory. And so here's the thing. The two incidents, Good Friday and the Transfiguration, are not so different. A Mount of Transfiguration, a Mount of Calvary. Two people with Jesus, Moses and Elijah at first. And of course the disciples, the Mount of Calvary. Two people, two thieves on the cross. People around, of course. And so it is. Jesus said to Peter and James and John as they were coming down the mountain, tell no one about the vision until Jesus is raised from the dead, which is even after the time of Good Friday. Peter and James and John didn't understand. They celebrated that incredible event, but they didn't understand. And so Peter wanted to make three tents, just prolong the situation, let's get to the bottom of it, let's learn what's going on. Peter was the one who suggested it. But we could imagine that James and John silently nodded. They were falling down on their faces too, as it were, in agreement with let's learn to see what's going on. But no, this is not why Jesus came. He wouldn't stay here on the Mount of Transfiguration, just as he wouldn't stay on the Mount of Calvary. He would carry on. It wasn't a glorious spectacle, really, that they were coming to see. The glory that our world wants to see, let's see Jesus do tricks, as it were, or let's see him do amazing miracles, although he can do it. And yet, Jesus came to suffer and die on the cross. Jesus' glory would be bathed with his own blood. His glory would be for the glorious one, for sinners like you and me. And so it's important that we celebrate the transfiguration of Jesus on the eve of entering the season of Lent. It's good that we put away our alleluias, our time of celebration, although we're having a time of celebration this morning for sure. And for it is important to know that the real reason for the transfiguration is of God's love for us in Christ Jesus. It isn't really what happened with Moses and Elijah on the mountain that day. That's who Jesus is and has been all along at his baptism, at his transfiguration. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus was God from the very beginning. He just showed it, revealed it for a moment. The real transfiguration was what happened when Jesus was hanging around, not with Moses and Elijah, but with the two criminals on each side of him on the cross. For when he who knew no sin became sin for us, St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21, when the glorious, sinless Son of God became sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God, so that in Jesus... Yes, we would have celebration, beautiful light, but we would know that our sins are forgiven even when we are in the depths of despair, that we are transfigured, as it were, from shame to glory, from sinner to saint, from death to life. So you see, Peter, James, and John, their mistake wasn't that they wanted to stay with Jesus in his glory. Jesus wanted to stay there too. 
And that's why he came for that very thing, to give us grace and peace and goodness, for Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And so Jesus wanted to stay there, but it wasn't the will of God the Father. And so just like with Peter and James and John wanting to have a special experience, that's not wrong. It's okay to want that. The danger, though, is if we think that because our life is in Christ, we're going to have all glory, then we're wrong. Because sometimes our life has more suffering than glory. Sometimes our life has more sickness than health. Sometimes there's more blood, sweat, and tears than there is ease. Sometimes there's more struggle than victory. And sometimes we, even the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh would want us to question the goodness of God, question God's ways, question the way that God works, questioning God's promises, questioning, saying, aren't all of the other religions of the world valid too? And yes, God can work through even the most convoluted so-called religion. For that is what God sends us into the world to, to shine the light of the gospel using God's words and God's word. And of course, knowing the key is at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So is God really my God, the one true God? Well, Satan wants us to say no. The world would want to use the cross that God used to save us to destroy us and our faith in Christ. And that's why when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, and we're going to hear that next week, next week's gospel reading for the first Sunday of Lent is of Jesus in the wilderness. Here's the devil who kept saying is, if you are the son of God, if this, if that, and why when Jesus was on the cross, Satan kept saying through Jesus' opponents, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, uh, come down from the cross, save yourself. If and why Satan keeps suggesting to us, if you're a child of God, if, then why so much trouble in your life? Why so much struggle? Why so much sin? Why so much struggle in our country? With our, whether it's a native population or whether it's all kinds of other things. Where is Jesus and his glory for you and for me or for the church, the Christian community, or just the secular community around us? Satan wants to blind you. Satan wants to blind me. Satan wants to blind us of the glory that God has for us. Satan wants us to focus on just the present, the temporary, the struggle that we have. Where is Jesus and his glory for you, would say Satan, the world, our sinful flesh. But against all this, to protect us from that, we have God's word. As a second lesson for today, said St. Uh, Peter, he said, we didn't follow clear, cleverly invented stories, but we have God's sure word. Peter said, God's word is more sure than the glory and the majesty that they saw on that day, the day of the transfiguration. God's word, where he says, we would do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a very dark place. And in those dark places and dark times of our lives that Satan uses to try to pull us away from Christ, to try to pull our faith in Christ out and down, give us faith in someone else, or something that doesn't save us from our sins, where the devil tries to ensnare us with doubt and fear, there God comes to us still with his sure word. The devil would want to convince us that we have and we worship our triune God on a cross who isn't much of a God after all. However, against that is the more sure, certain word. 
that was sent forth on that day of the transfiguration from a bright cloud, a cloud that was just incredibly overpowering, where that voice of God was heard and spoken. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. It isn't just a temporary person, temporary, but this is my son, whom I'm well pleased. And so we began the Epiphany season, hearing those same words at Jesus' baptism. Now God the Father says them again. No matter what happens, no matter what we see, God's word is truth. And it stands as a lamp shining in a dark place. But now these words are added to from his baptism. Transfiguration time says, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Listen to the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Listen to Jesus as our Savior, not to Satan who is trying to deceive you. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus, not the world where the people would think that they know better. Listen to him. Listen to the Lord, not to your doubts and fears. Listen to him. And when we do this, this is what we're going to hear. Rise and have no fear. Take up your, your bed and walk. We hear, Father, forgive them. Today you will be with me in paradise. Where it is finished. The battle is over. The victory is won. We'll hear, I baptize you. I forgive you. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for the forgiveness of sins, the assurance of life and salvation. And those are the glorious words that come only through the cross of Calvary, only from Jesus. Outside of the cross of Calvary, outside of Jesus, we have only fear, for our sins are still upon us. Outside the cross, there is no forgiveness from our sins. Other people in the world may forgive us, but that isn't forgiveness of sins that are damnable. Outside the cross, paradise, heaven is locked. Outside the cross, salvation isn't finished, but it's up to us and to our feeble efforts. Outside the cross of Calvary, baptism is just plain old water. The absolution is just wishful thinking or saying, don't worry about it. It's okay. Outside the cross, the things of God aren't glorious. Outside the cross, Jesus' transfiguration, his baptism is his, but it's not for anyone else. But with the cross, with the cross of Calvary, we have the promises that go with it. That Jesus is risen from the dead. The glory of Jesus is with us, not only to the three select disciples, to Peter, James, and John, but to all the men and women, the boys and girls, then and there and before and here and now and throughout all eternity is for me and for you personally. Which is what John saw when he looked up a few years later, when he saw an old, as an old man, he was exiled to Siberia, as it were. He was exiled to Patmos, the island. He wrote that vision that he saw down in his revelation. When he saw, quote, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And so a multitude which would have included Moses and Elijah and Deborah and Peter and James and John, the criminal that once hung next to Jesus who said, forgive me, and Jesus did, and includes you and me. For that picture John saw wasn't a snapshot of a moment in time, but of all time. The vision of what Jesus came to provide through his cross, and the glorious vision and the glorious future that includes you and me. We are baptized we are children of our Heavenly Father. And that when we die, we don't need to fear death because we are with the Lord always. We are God's people. Our sins are forgiven, washed in the blood of the Lamb, washed in the cleansing water of our baptism. 
And so when things are not glorious for you or for loved ones, when harm seems to be having its time more than goodness, when the struggle is long, the battle is tough, we look to Jesus, look up and see our Savior on the cross and the empty cross and the empty tomb for you and for me. When our sins take over or threaten to take over, when the world seems to be going down the tubes, know that God still reaches out to us in Christ Jesus to give us a glory beyond the grave, a glory beyond our worst situation, our worst case scenario even. And so as we enter the season of Lent this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, that's what we're going to do again. And we do day by day as we are in God's word. As we go on week by week and minute by minute, we look up and we listen to Jesus. We'll hear and we'll see in different ways the cross of Calvary. We'll hear of God's goodness to us. We'll look up and we'll listen. We'll look up from the dust and ashes of our sin and see the hope, hear of the hope, the glory and the future that is bright, that awaits us. We'll hear and we'll rejoice. Rejoice that we have a Savior, Jesus, who didn't stay in his glory, but who came down the mountain, who came down to us to dwell, to tabernacle, to live among us. And he was transfigured before us, not just for a moment, but the Lord is with us forever. And we thank God for that, even on days when the sun isn't shining. And so as we go through different times of challenge, different times of trouble, know that God's grace is there for us still. Sometimes we don't feel it, and even when we don't feel it, know that we have God's sure word, that you are loved, that I am loved, that our sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, and that we can sing a new song all of our days, really and truly, to God's glory. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, like that incredible transfiguration light, guard and keep our hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus, both now and to life everlasting. Amen.